Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Now let me be the first to tell you that I have not always obeyed that scripture and give thanks in all things, for it is the will of God concerning me. I've been doing a reno renovation on the house for about three weeks, and uh, I'm trying to wind this thing down and put a brand new door in, and I bought three pieces of trim to go around the interior side, and I cut that trim, and I've done this a hundred times. It's a piece of cake. It's really nothing to it. So I marked it out, and I went in, and I shot that piece of trim, and I shot the middle piece of trim. I think I've done the first one over there and then the right one. I grabbed the left one, and I held it up and got the 45 just right, and I was just about to shoot it, and I looked down, and it was about that far from the floor. And I did not say, thank you, Lord. I just give you thanks in all things. As a matter of fact, my wife said, honey, it's just a board. We'll get another one. But I was frustrated. I said, I have cut that board the wrong length. I do this hundreds of times. I mean, I, and it's easy to do. It's easy to cut one backwards. It's easy to cut the wrong angle. But something so simple and so menial, and I'm thinking to myself, this aggravates me to no end. Why? Because i got to quit what I'm doing and go get another board. And then I've got to paint that board. And i got to wait for that board to dry. And then cut it again and put it up. Just aggravating. And so I, I'm just here to tell you, I failed in that regard. I didn't just say, well, thank you, Lord, anyway. And that's what I should have done. That would just give the devil a black eye and bloody nose if, you know, if I just said, well, just praise God anyway. He said, give thanks in all things. That means if you go home and there's a rollback hooked up to your Tahoe because you didn't make the payment, well, praise God anyway. Let's give thanks unto the Lord. Hello? Now, you, th you say, now, Pastor, now, now, it might be stupid that you let it get that far behind, and again, you might not have no control over it. But it's going to be a learning experience for you. In all things, we are to give thanks. It is the will of God for you and I in Christ Jesus. Thursday's Thanksgiving. Amen. And my birthday, just, just so you know. I was born and the whole world gave thanks. That's what my dad told me anyway. <laughs> no. I'm sorry to put you through that, but Thanksgiving night, 1966. But anyway, nonetheless, um, we are to give thanks in all things. And so I, I wanted to bring a message to you today that, um, that really illustrates and just lays out that if Daniel could give thanks where he was, you and I ought to be able to give thanks where we are. In fact, Daniel, um, he was deported from Judah when he was about 13 years old, he was a young guy. It was uh, not only Daniel, but um, there was Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. These guys became known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel became known as Belteshazzar. Now, I want you to picture this. He's a 1,000 miles from home, and you're under a government, Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian Empire, and they want to remove all vestiges of Jerusalem. They want to get the temple out of their mind. They don't want, matter of fact, they're not, the bell to Shazer had to do with Baal. They, they did not want any vestiges or any remembrance of the holy God that, that Israel served. And so they're a thousand miles from home, and here he is, but yet in a foreign land. He learns to say, thank you, Lord, anyway. So here he is. Some of you know what happened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the chapter before. They were there. And, of course, Nebuchadnezzar had built an image to himself because he thought he was really important. And they said everybody is to bow down to this image. And, of course, these three Hebrew boys did not bow down. He brought them in his office and said, listen, if you guys will do in here what you wouldn't do out there, we'll go outside and we'll say everything's good to go. And they bowed to the image. And basically what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said is we're not going to be a hypocrite. We're not going to do in here what we wouldn't do out there. And, um, and they said, well, you know, if you don't, we're going to put you in a fiery furnace seven times hotter than any fire. Uh, we're we're going to make it seven times hotter than we have any other fire, and you'll be thrown in there. And he says, well... Um, 
be it known unto you, O king, we're not even careful to answer you in this matter. Our God's able to deliver us, but if he don't, just be assured he has delivered us from you. So they had their minds made up. Now, now Daniel had a very similar situation. Now, these were four wonderful, um, very awesome men in, in Jerusalem that was deported because Babylon did not come in and take a bunch of lowlifes. They took the best of the best. They took them back and they trained them in their writings. They trained them in their laws. They trained them in their customs and, and in their government. And so we have this situation. But here's what you got to know today if you don't know anything else. It is in order to give thanks always. I said it's always in order to give thanks. Even if my hard uh, illustration comes to pass and the rollback is there when you get home. Even if you open the mailbox and there's dreadful news in the mailbox, it is still in order to give thanks. Now, I want to show you today what will happen if we take that position of giving thanks to God without respect to what has happened or not. Because all things are not fun. Hello? I have gone to the doctor before, and I did not have a fun time. I have gone to the, doc the dentist recently only to show me the proposal of my care and my pitiful insurance and what I got to pay. And $3,400 later, I got to say, thank you, Lord, anyway. At least I'll have some teeth when I'm through. <laughs> Amen. And, you know, so all things are not good. But God causes all things to work together for the good to those who love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. So if you, you just got to know that in everything we are to give thanks in every situation, we should be willing to give thanks everywhere and every when. Now, if Daniel could do it a thousand miles from Jerusalem and could find a reason to praise God, you and I ought to be able to do it right here at home. I'm not saying that bad things don't happen because certainly they do. But I'm telling you this, in order to rise above all of this that does happen, if you can just say, I'm just going to thank God anyway, man, that will really give the devil the old one too. When you say, you know what, you're going to try to derail me with this situation, but I'm going to be thankful and I'm going to bless God regardless. So I want you to know that our thankfulness and our thankfulness is an expression um, that should be expressed regardless what we're going through. And our thankfulness should not be determined by our circumstances because it's easy to rejoice if, you know, if your winning lottery ticket hits and you get the Powerball. <clears throat> y'all with me? Now, I know some of y'all buying them now, but if you win, I need you to pay tithe on it, all right? So it's easy to praise God if Ed McMahon shows up at your door or your rich, you know, Uncle Bill dies and leaves you a yacht. Man, oh, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Old Aunt Susie finally kicked the bucket and she left you a lot of land. Hallelujah, love Susie's heart. Huh? It's easy to thank God for that. But if something happens and it's not so fun, if something happens and it tries you, if you open Facebook and there's a big write-up about you and it's not glorious, can you just say, well, I think I'll just thank God anyhow. And I'm just going to worship him. So let me, if I may, uh, take you to Daniel chapter 6. And I, I just want to go through some of this um, passage to help you understand where we're at. So here's what happened. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom, three administrators over them. One of them was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. So these satraps were put in place so that there would be no fraud, so that the king would not lose money. Daniel was highly esteemed. Let, let's read further and I'll show you. Now, Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king, somebody say the king, the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. So Daniel was a standout. Y'all with me? 
He was head and shoulders above everybody else in, in, in the whole deal. And so at this, what's this, verse 4, at this, the administrators of the satraps tried to find grounds of charges against Daniel. Isn't that something? About time you try to get ahead, somebody wants to knock you down. Has it ever happened to you? You're trying to get ahead and God's giving you some favor and some jealous person wants to take it away. They tried to find charges, you know, or grounds for charges against Daniel in the conduct of his government affairs, but they were unable to do so. So they could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. I've done a little bit of study. Scholars said that the administrators and the satraps and the precepts got together and said, the only way we're going to find any dirt on Daniel is if we cook it up. Sound like our government, don't it? It doesn't matter what side you're on. They'll both cook it up if it fits their fancy. Democrat, Republican, Independent. So nonetheless, they said, well, we ain't re Daniel, You know, the king's about to appoint Daniel over the whole region. So we're going to cook up something wrong with him. We're going to have to show the king that there's a reason he's not quite this flower child. He's not this golden boy that he thinks he is. You always got one out there. You've always got somebody that wants to knock you down. You know, you're trying to get ahead in life, and God's giving you favor, and they're jealous. And you know what? I want to tell you something it's real quick. It ain't even in the notes, so I ain't going to charge you for this. But it's a sad state of affairs when you can't be happy for someone else succeeding. So anyway, let's go on. They could, they could find no corruption because he was not corrupt. He was trustworthy. He was not corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we ain't never going to find any basis for charges against Daniel unless we find something to do with the law of his God. So notice what they did. They got together and said, well, we're going to cook something up here. So now I want you to keep in mind, Daniel stood head and shoulders above everybody else because the king had said, I'm thinking about putting Daniel in charge of the whole region. Keep that in mind. Verse 6, so the administrators, the satraps, went as a group to the king. They got his group together. They all got their text that morning. Y'all, let's go to the king. I'm joking. And they got there and they said, may King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, the prefects, the satraps, and the advisors and governors have all agreed. That's a lie. How did they all agree? Daniel wasn't even there. He was the one the king thought most of, of. He was the one he thought most highly about. But they've gotten together, and they went to the king and said, King, we've all got together. That'd be like my staff getting together and coming and saying, now, you know, Josh, come and say, now, Pastor, we've all got together. We got together with the whole staff, but yet Adam wasn't there. And the whole staff agreed we ought to do this, but yet key people were not there. Then you've lied. The whole staff was not there. They told the king, all of the prefects, uh, all of the satraps, all of the governors, we're all, we got together, and we've come and agreed upon this. They were lying to the king. And the king didn't realize it. But they said, um, we've all agreed that the king should issue an edict. That's a law. And enforce that decree that anyone who prays to any god or human during the next 30 days, except you, your majesty, may be thrown into the lion's or shall be thrown into the lion's den. Not may, but shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now, the law of the Medes and the Persians was this. If the king signed a law... It didn't matter what it was, it could not be repealed. It had to be carried out. Are you all with me? And so they've gone to the king and they've duped him because he thought a lot of Daniel because he wanted to put Daniel in charge just underneath him. It reminds me of Joseph back. You remember dreaming Joseph? How Joseph was sold by his own Hebrew brothers. They sold him into Egyptian slavery and he went down there in Egypt. But God, even through trials and even through hardships, even with two years in prison for rape that he did not commit, God elevated him to the second in command 
in all of Egypt, in the entire country of Egypt. I just wanted to tell you, just real quick, we have evidence with Joseph, and we have evidence with Moses, and we have evidence with Daniel, that if you'll just be straight with God and be thankful to God, even in a foreign country, God can raise you up. God can take the enemy's money. Don't you know the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous? God raised, uh, God, God raised Moses with Pharaoh's money. Did you know that? God raised um, Moses with Pharaoh's money and allowed uh, Moses' mother, Jochebed, to come live in the house as his nanny. She, they didn't even know it. He's a good God. He's a good, good father. So, so let, me, let me stay with my story here. So, King, please sign this so that it cannot be changed. So, now here's what I want you to understand. Daniel heard, Daniel learned that the decree had been published. He probably got a notification on Twitter. He said, now all the satraps and all the kings and all the governors They've met with the king, and he, you know, he might have thought, well, I wonder what kind of meeting was this? The king signed a decree, and I'm, the, I'm kind of the golden boy. I'm the one he thinks so much about. But, I mean, this is not written in the text, but I think it's worth you and I at least pondering. But, but I wonder why he didn't even talk with me. He didn't email me. He didn't call me. He didn't say nothing to me. I'll tell you what Daniel did do. There's one thing that he could have questioned, and that was his relationship with the king. But one thing he did not question was his relationship with God. Notice this. Daniel learned about the decree that had been published. He went home to his upstairs room where the window opened toward Jerusalem and three times a day he got on his knees and prayed and gave thanks to God just as he had done before. So he's just now learned about the new law in town that if anybody prays to or worships another God or another human being other than King Darius, they shall be thrown into a den of lions. He walked in his house. He walked up the stairs. He flung the window open that faced toward Jerusalem. He got on his knees and he began to pray and worship God and give thanks as he had done three times a day since he was there. Thank God for some people that are dedicated that say, you know what, come hell or high water, I am going to worship God. <clears throat> There's something about being grateful, something about being thankful. I, I got thinking about Job. You remember Job? He lost all of his, you know, his children, he lost his animals, he lost his wealth, he lost his reputation. And his wife come to him and said, Job, why did you do this? Job had made a statement. He says, honey, should we accept the good things from God and not the bad? Don't it rain on just people and unjust people? She said, Job, you've lost this and you've lost that and you've lost the other. Why don't you just curse God and die? And he says, because I know my Redeemer lives. And at that last day, I shall see God and not another even when the skin worms devour this old flesh, yet in my body shall I see God. So here he is, boils oozing from his head to his toe. His reputation is ruined. His friends won't speak to him, but he finds a way to be thankful anyway. Huh? He, and there's something about being thankful like that. Well, let me just show you. These men went as a group. They found Daniel praying and asking for God's help. So they went back to the king about his royal decree and said, Did you not publish this decree? That then for the next 30 days, if anybody prayed to anybody except you, they'd be thrown the lines then? Yes, the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians. It cannot be repealed. They said, Well, king, that Daniel fellow, that dude, the exile from Judah, we was by his house today and we heard him praying. That window was up, and I looked up there, and sure enough, on the third level, there he was. He was on his knees. He was praying toward Jerusalem, praying to God, Jehovah. Mm. They knew what they was doing. They knew he was going to pray. These sad guys that, that were so jealous of him, he still prays three times a day. They knew he prayed three times a day. And when the king heard this, he was greatly distressed, and he was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort till sundown to save him. So Darius loved Daniel. He wanted to make him right in charge of the whole region under him. But now he realizes that he's been duped 
by these governors and satraps, and there ain't a thing he can do about it because he had signed it into law, a law that could not be repealed. So now he has nothing left to do but trust God. And I just had a revelation. Sometimes God allows us to get it between a, a rock and a hard spot where we can't do anything else but trust God. So here's a pagan king that don't know God. Here's a guy, I mean, Darius don't know God. Now let me, I want to tell you all something that's kind of amazing to me because did you know the Babylonians are the ones that exiled him from, from Judah, that took him. That was Nebuchadnezzar. And he would serve under Nebuchadnezzar all the way to, I think his grandson, Nebuchadnezzar, or Nebuchadnezzar all the way to Belshazzar because now Belteshazzar was his nickname, Daniel's. Belshazzar was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, so, or the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, the son of Nebuchadnezzar. So nonetheless, he served the Babylonian Empire. He served King Darius, the Median Empire, the Medes. He served under Cyrus the Persian, the Persian Empire. Do you see the grace of God in that? Absolutely, because in those days, when a regime changed, they killed everybody. That's right. They just wiped slate. I mean, they, they just wiped. There wasn't going to be no leaking. Huh. Psst. Off with everybody's head. They killed them all. But yet, this guy, because of the favor of God that is on him, has served Nebuchadnezzar. Huh? He served all the way to his grandson. In fact, he's the one that interpreted the writing on the wall for King uh, Belshazzar. And then he served under Darius, Darius the Mede. And they say that he was approaching 100 years old by the time he served Cyrus the Persian. The hand of God upon his life. And, and I find him in a foreign place, in a hard situation, but yet faithful and thankful. So notice with me, if you will, uh, what, what's happened here. So the king gave the order, and they threw Daniel in the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. I love the testimony that Daniel had. The testimony, that, let me say this, while some of you are trying to buddy up to this one and chum up to that one, just be faithful to God and let him elevate you up through the ranks. I don't have to have the connection with this person and that person and the other. As long as my connection is right with him, promotion cometh from the Lord. Somebody just need to hear that. So they threw him in the lion's den. The stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed it with his own signet ring. I didn't realize this, but they, threw a rock, they put a rock in the place of the mouth of the cave, and they brought some sort of seal across here. I'm assuming it's some sort of clay or something. And the king pressed his ring into that, and then all of these other governors, they pressed the seal of their ring into it too to make sure that that thing did not get disturbed. And when they come back, that seal was still there so that nobody rescued him. Y'all with me? How many of you know God don't need nobody to come rescue you? Uh-huh. Daniel, he's thrown in that lion's den, but Daniel had a testimony. The next morning, the king, oh, well, let me tell you about that nighttime first. You got a pagan king that didn't know God. He testifies when they throw him in there. He says, Daniel, your God will be able to save you. Your God will, I want to tell you something, Daniel's God will become King Darius' God. You know why? Because he will see such a, a powerful arm. He will see what God has done. So Darius goes home that night. You can read this. He goes back home that night, and the Bible says he would not eat a bite. He would not be entertained. All he did all night long was fast and pray. So here's a man that did not know God that fasted and prayed until he got a hold of God. Why? He had already signed an edict, and it was out of his hands. And according to the edict that he signed, Daniel was a dead boy. But according to the God that I serve, uh, who causes light to shine in darkness and flowers to bloom in a desert place, here is a God that is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all you can think or ask. At daybreak that morning, Darius got out of bed. He got on his shoes, and he ran to that tomb. Or, well, it's supposed to be a tomb. It wasn't a tomb. It was the den of lions. But, but it would be a tomb for anybody who goes there because you die there. Truly Death Valley. But he gets there, and he says, Oh, Daniel! He says uh, in an anguished voice, servant of the living God, 
Has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lions? And he's listening. And the voice answers, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel. Woo! Wait a minute. There was a rock in the way. Wait a minute. There were seals and signet rings that... Hey, hey, you remember when, when, when the Bible says Jesus met the disciples at first, Thomas was not there. And he said, except I see the Lord and feel the fingerprints and see the, the scar in his side, I will in no wise believe. The next time they got together behind locked doors, the Bible said Jesus just showed up right, right through the door. And then when he got inside, uh, he looked at Thomas and said, uh, wherefore did you doubt Handle me and see. Thomas hit his knees and kind of like King Darius said, my Lord and my God. I, last night, I was a pagan, but today I'm a believer. Amen. Why? Because of the thankfulness of somebody named Daniel. Because of the faithfulness of somebody. Look at him. He's a thousand miles from home. He's deported from his cousins, his aunts, his uncles, his brothers, his mama, his daddy. Everybody says he should have been moaning and groaning and crying, wanting to go home. But he decided to make the best of what he had to deal with. And when we decide, hey, guess what? They'll never take me where God's not. You can never take me out of the presence of God. Where shall I flee from the presence of God? What if I take the, you know, uh, if I ascend into the heavens, behold, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, thou art there also. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, guess what? There all, th thou art there also, and thy right hand upholds me. Whither then shall I flee from the presence of the Lord? I cannot go where he's not. That means you can't take me where he's not. Well, so Daniel, serve the living God as your God, been able to continue to rescue you. Daniel answered, may the king live forever. He sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. Could you imagine an angel just perching up right here? I can get this. Angel sits here and says, all right, boy, just calm down. Daniel's sleeping over there, his head on a rock. Old lion walks over, sort of sniffs him, a little hungry. And that angel said, get back in your seat. Sit over there and just perch yourself like a good cat should. Are you all with me? He said, the lions never took a bite. The lions, you know why? The angel shut their mouth. Woo. I got some mouths I wish God would shut. That just now hit me. I don't know where it... He said, but the angels shut their mouth. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed, and he gave the orders to lift Daniel now out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. At the king's command, the men who falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and their children. Children, your foolishness affects more than just you. I just want you to know that. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed them. I got a feeling the old angel just done like this. He's still sitting here. Daniel's pulled up. And they threw them boys down. The angel said, supper time. Eat. Eat. I, I, I need to try to tie this up. So... Thankfulness says, I trust God when there's no evidence that I should trust God. Woo. Thankfulness says, I trust God when there's no evidence that I should. The world looks at you. That's what Job's wife was saying. Job, we've lost our children, we've lost the donkeys, we, 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 we've lost the camels, we've lost our reputation, we've lost everything, and there's no evidence. But yet you tell me, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Thankfulness is trusting. You see, 
It's easy to trust God when things are going good. But it takes faith and confidence in that unseen hand of God to believe him when there's no evidence that you should. But I got some evidence. I've got a book called the Holy Bible. I have an unfailing record of God's faithfulness when everybody counted my God out. He showed up in the nick of time. Everybody, all the satraps, all the governors, everybody said Daniel's dead meat. But God sent his angel. Huh? And the angel said, sit right there. And don't you even lick your lips. We should be willing to give him thanks everywhere and every when. Thankfulness in the good times is easily understood. If you call me and say, be thankful with me, Pastor, I just won a thousand dollars. Praise God, I'm thankful with you. Be thankful with me, I'm, I'm thankful. But thankfulness in the hard times is easily misunderstood. People look at you and you've just been diagnosed with cancer and you just can't help but cry and you're worshiping and you're dancing and you're just having a great time. You're praising God and blessing God and people are like, man, you're crazy. I don't get that. And you say, you ain't got to understand. I know there ain't no evidence, but he is still God and he's still a healer and he's still my God if he heals me in this life or that one. So, um, thankfulness, I'm thankful not because I got my way, but I'm thankful because he got his. His way is often a hard way. It's a winding road, a path where there doesn't seem much reason to stop and say thank you, but his way is the best way. So I'll just thank him anyway. So we've got to be thankful in every situation. That's what I call upon you to do as a next step, to thank him anyway. April the 15th of 1985, I got on a Greyhound bus and left for Atlanta. Spent the night at a Red Roof Inn after leaving the MEP station. Flew to San Antonio, Texas and met the nicest men I've ever met. I'm only joking. They were nice in the airport. They got rather cruel once we got away from the airport on the bus and they put an exponent on it when we got off at Lackland. But I had four years of Army ROTC. I was a battalion commander in my high school, and so I had done, I had done well. And you had, I had what they call proficiency advancement. That meant I only had to stay at boot camp for three weeks. But I would have to take a test on the eighth day. Passing that test, I could leave in three weeks instead of the entire boot camp. But again, you got, to, you got to learn that entire basic military training, you know, for the Air Force. The entire, you got to know the whole book to be able to test it. Everybody else is going to have the whole six weeks. I'm going to have one. Get it. So I went and took that test early one morning. Me and a couple more guys, it was PAs. The test was graded, and it was a 69. The guy said, Emerson Sainz, you're drill instructor can determine whether or not you're allowed to test again since you got a 69. He may let you take it again. If he does, you're still good to go. I'll never forget, I went back to his office, made a request to see him, walked in, done my salute and all the things he had to do in boot camp. Showed him that paper. Obviously wanted him to allow me to test again. He whipped his pen right out of his pocket and with a smirk on his face, he wrote, Denied! You will stay here every day with the rest of the guys. And I wish I could tell you that I said, thank God, anyhow. I really couldn't tell you. I didn't say nothing because I didn't want to bow up at him and, you know, uh, make things worse. Son, I'll tell you what I did, dude. I left out there and I was beat down, man. I was, in my heart, I was weeping. And I didn't have no good thoughts for him. When we got finished several weeks later, I don't remember, but it was May 30th, I know that. Um, 
I'll never forget the morning. We was all dressed in blues, and we was headed some to the airport, some to the bus station, going different places wherever for technical training. And I walked up to Staff Sergeant Strong. That was his name, and he lived up to it. And I handed him my annual, and I asked him, would you sign it? He reached in his pocket and pulled a handkerchief out and started wiping his eyes. He was crying. He said, Saints, I can't imagine you wanted me to sign your book after I terminated your PA status. But, of course, now I'm good to go, man. I graduated yesterday. He said, but I bet you're glad you stayed with the rest of us now, ain't you? I said, yes, I am. Or, sir, yes, I am, sir. The deal is this. I was thankful that day. I was not thankful several weeks ago. I was not thankful then. Here's what you got to understand. It's easy to thank him in the good times, but it takes trust and faith to thank him in the hard times. Let me tie it up by saying this. They lifted Daniel out. They threw the men in with their wives and their children. At the king's command, those who falsely accused Daniel were brought and thrown into the lion's den with their wives and their children before they even reached the floor. Their bones was crushed. King Darius wrote to all the nations of the peoples of every language in all the earth and said, may you prosper greatly as you stand with me. He said, I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God. Think about this. Last night he didn't even know him. But he had an all-night prayer meeting. And he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed and his dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Here's what I want you to know. People who are thankful, God helps them. And they always end up, I don't know how, but God takes all things and works them together for the good of them that love God and are called according to His purpose. When we are thankful in all things, and I know this is going to come back on me, I know. Because the next time I cut a board wrong, Hey, some of them boards cost $30, $40 a piece. Y'all with me? Not that trim board, thank God. That one was only five and a half. If you cut a wrong one that you can't put it back, you're in trouble. I want to tell you this. If you'll have an attitude of gratitude, if you'll decide, I'm just going to thank God anyway. And here's my challenge for me and you, because I'm as deep in this as you are. When something goes bad, to just step back. Say, I just choose. I'm not a 1,000 miles from home. I'm not in a foreign land. I'm right here. All my grandbabies live within five miles of me. Oh, and my children. Right? I'll just thank God anyway. And so that's, that's our next step. While you bow your heads with me, I, I want us to just say, God, I choose to be thankful and I choose to be grateful even when I come home and things aren't what it ought to be, when things seem bad, when circumstances are messed up, I'm not going to cuss and rant and rave and go get drunk. I'm just going to back up and say, thank God anyhow. God is going to make a way. So, Lord, let that be in the name of Jesus as we enter this Thanksgiving week right now. I don't want it to be where I give thanks just at Thanksgiving, but I want to be thankful to you all my days. I want it to be the habit that people look at me and they know that is a thankful man, that that man loves God and he's thankful to God even though he goes through hard times and circumstances. So, Lord, let our next steps be steps that says I'm thankful to God. Regardless of what I'm going through, I choose to live a life of thankfulness in Jesus' name. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Our host is coming.